be with us here today. Receive from God what he would have for you. Be blessed today. Um, and for our regulars, I hope you are blessed as well. Um, you guys, I, maybe you do know, but having gone through quarantine when there was no one here and we were doing things online, there is a radically different spirit here when there are people here, when there are people that are, are responding and engaging than there is when there's empty chairs. Um, God has made me very aware and very grateful um, for all of you. So, um, earlier this week, um, there was a question that was posted on Facebook by a friend of mine from high school. Um, you know, on uh, the thing that amazes me is, is I look at Facebook and I wonder how all my classmates got so old. <laughs> I mean, I look at them and they're all like gray or bald and overweight and, and they, they, they got bags under their eyes and, and I don't remember going to school with people like that. Um, <clears throat> but she posted this question, uh, she is a believer, and she said, what does it mean to fear God? Um, Proverbs tells us what about fear? It's the beginning of wisdom. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Um, but how does that work for us as believers? I mean, do, do we come boldly before the throne of grace? Absolutely, because the way has been opened to us, the veil has been rent. We have the blood price of Jesus Christ that brings us, that allows us to come before the throne of grace and receive mercy and grace. And, and we can lay our burdens down before him. But I think Steve was right on point. It was actually something that the Spirit was kind of stirring up in me as we were singing this morning and I was listening to the words. I think sometimes we have made God so much our buddy that we forget his transcendence. We forget that he is other than we are. We will never be God. He will always be beyond us. Okay? We are the creation. He is the creator. And we need to remember that even though we are children of God. All right, I'm going to give you my mini rant. Not all humans are children of God. They're all creations of God. But scripture makes it very clear that to them that believe, he gave the right to become the children of God. Okay? So only those that believe are his children. And so, as his children, um, we will inherit we're co-heirs with Christ, so we will inherit all that Christ was inheriting and has inherited. And, and we have a different status now, but we got to remember that he's God. <clears throat> he's not like us. He's beyond us. He's beyond even our ability to comprehend. He's beyond our ability to understand. Um, we, we, uh, we have his word, but beyond his word, we have his spirit. And his spirit is what gives his word, makes his word understandable to us. In my reading this week, I was reading in Corinthians, and Paul is talking to the Corinthians, and he's telling them, you know, that the word to us is, is power and life, but to the non-believer, it's it doesn't make sense. It, it's of no value. Uh, I can't tell you how many people that I've talked to that uh, they come to me and, and they say, the Bible just doesn't make sense. And that immediately puts up a red flag to me because if the Bible is not making sense, it's because you're either not indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, the seal of your salvation, or you're not allowing him to teach you. And both of those are very bad things. 
Okay? So first, if, if you do not have the Spirit of God in you, of course it's not going to make sense. It wasn't written for you. Well, it was. But it wasn't. Okay? I mean, it, it is because this is where we get our understanding. But, but really, without the Spirit to give us the understanding, I mean, it, it's like reading a different language. We, we have got to get past this idea that God is our buddy. You, you look at the way that Christ lived his life and the things that he did and the relationship that he had with the Father. And I think we can start drawing some, some, some wisdom out of this because... Um, Jesus, I, I, I've said this before, and, and uh, I know some of you disagree with me, but that's okay. Um, I don't believe you should ever have me time. Okay, That's one of those phrases that just sticks in my craw. I just need some me time. Look at what me time was in the life of our Savior. What was me time for him? Yeah, and, and, and that's really what the me time for a Christian needs to be, to get that refreshing, that re-energizing, that, that, that renewal by spending time alone with the Father, okay? I tell you what, if you will commit yourself to spending that time with the Father, it's going to do you a whole lot more good and, and will, will have more benefit in your life than going to the spa yeah. <laughs> or going fishing or whatever else it is that you do. You know, when this lady cut my hair yesterday, or she shaved my head yesterday, it was kind of weird for me. Um, because she she did, she like put stuff on my head and rubbed my head. I don't like people touching me, okay? Um, I, I uh, if you're in my bubble, okay? But if you're not in my bubble, please don't touch me. And so it's hard for me when people start doing things like this. <laughs> and, and, you know, <laughs> and, and so, you know, a lot of people would be just like, oh, that feels so good. I'm like, oh, would you please stop? Okay. I can't enjoy that because I don't like to be touched. And then her hands, they put stuff on my head and it was, it was, it was slimy. And then, and then she comes walking up and she says, okay, we're going to put a hot <laughs> towel on your head. And it was like, wow, yeah, that is a hot towel. <laughs> okay, so after a little while, she takes the towel off and I think, all right, now, now there's going to be shaving and, and scraping and, and then she throws another hot towel on my head. I don't know what it means when you get two hot towels. I, I, there's got to be something about that. Maybe she just wanted me to you know, be ultra relaxed. She felt how tense my brain was. <laughs> and then she took it off and she rubbed more stuff on my head. <laughs> Look, I could have been done with this. Zip, 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 zip. I've done it. But you know what happened? Today I woke up, my head's like Velcro. <laughs> oh, laugh all you want. Try and get a shirt on over a head of Velcro. <laughs> That's no, that's no fun. All right? All right, coming back. Let's bring this back around. Um, if you have your Bibles, open to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to advance in our study of Philippians. i got to touch on a little bit of what we covered before. Um, let me just wrap up the first part by saying... I don't have a problem with people that go to the spa. I don't have a problem with people that go fishing. I don't have a problem with people that, that like to get by themselves and they get refreshed and energized being by themselves. That, that, that's me. Uh, if I, my alone time, when I'm by myself, that's usually when I get more refreshed. When I'm around people, it's exhausting. I have five children. Four of the five of them talk incessantly. And it's exhausting. Um, Poor Donovan. He never got a word in. 
I don't have a problem if you take time and, and get yourself refreshed and re-energized and recharged. Just be careful how you're doing it. Okay? Because true refreshing comes from the Spirit of God. And spending time alone with the Spirit of God, getting energized, getting refreshed, allowing His Word to speak to you, spending time in prayer. And, and we're actually going to be talking about prayer here a bit today. So, so um, we come back to a right understanding of just how awesome God is. Just how incredibly transcendent, far beyond our reach He is. Because see, if we could reach him, we wouldn't have needed Jesus Christ. Okay? So, so start there. Start there with the right understanding of who he is and who you are. And then you start to get you, you start to understand what an amazing thing his love is. That, that he would love us so much that he would make a way that we could come into his presence. And then, then you start to have this awe. This amazement about who he is. He's so much more than a fishing buddy. All right. So we have gone through a good part of uh, Philippians chapter 1. Um, two weeks ago we wrapped up uh, verse... Uh, let's see, we got down to... Verse 18, uh, Paul uh, is addressing the Philippians, uh, just kind of a little brief background. Uh, Paul is in prison. This is considered one of the prison epistles. He's in prison in Rome. He's under house arrest. Um, we talked about uh, the purpose of this letter being that the Philippians were supporting him. So he is writing, this is a, a four chapter thank you note that Paul is writing to the church of Philippi. Okay, um, we, we talked about what an incredible thing, you know, with my, my absolute firm belief is that there is not one word in here that's here on accident. Every single word is in here with a reason and with a purpose in the original language, okay, in the original languages, all right? Sometimes we, we kind of mess things up. You know, you, you know my illustration about the word love, okay? You know, in English we have love. Do you love to eat the same way you love your wife, or your husband, or your dog, <coughs> or your cat? <laughs> I don't get that. All right? So we, we've talked a little bit about this. We talked about him being in prison. What an amazing thing that must have been for the Praetorian guards who had to be with him every day because Paul never shut up about the gospel. Uh, he even goes so far as to say, uh, because of my imprisonment, the entire household, the entire palace guard knows the gospel. Why? Because they got to come in and hear it every day. We, we talked about what an amazing thing uh, his, his, his uh, opening statement was, uh, his prayer for the, the church at Philippi. We talked a little bit about how the church was established. Um, a couple weeks ago, we talked about... Um, those that were preaching Christ for good reason because they, they were motivated, they were prompted by, by Paul's boldness in being in chains for the gospel and they took courage from that and they went out and preached. And then there were those other ones that were preaching from selfish motives, uh, trying to in some way diminish Paul. And, and we wrapped up uh, with verse 18 and, and Paul says, What then? Uh, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed and in that I rejoice. And what an amazing, marvelous thing that is. Okay? Because these people that were preaching in pretense, they were looking to do harm to Paul. You read through the book of Acts and you chart out his missionary journeys. And, and uh, I've heard a, a fairly good reasoned argument that the thorn in his flesh was not a physical thing, but that it was actually the Judaizers that pursued him that followed around behind him. And every time he would go into a city, people from the previous city would come and, and they would try to tear down what his work and what he was doing. And, and in, in many cases, uh, he ended up having to leave the city. In one case, they took him outside and stoned him. And Paul being Paul, he got up and went back in the city. 
Okay? Uh, personally, I believe that's when Paul went to heaven. I believe in that moment he was dead. And he went to heaven. And God showed him what he wanted him to see. And then he sent him back. You don't have to believe that. That's not going to get you into heaven or hold you back. God's not going to be looking at your report card going, Oh yeah, you know, Glenn said this and you're not there. So uh, and don't, don't worry about that. That's a non-essential. Okay? So we talked about this. What an amazing thing that Paul... His focus, his drive, his desire is that Christ is preached. Okay. So we're going to pick up uh, in verse, we're actually going to pick up in the last of, of verse 18. Um, I like the way that the ESV does this because it appends the last part of verse 18 to the coming thought in verse 19. Um, I think it's a transition statement as Paul is going on to the next subject. Um, so he says in verse 18, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. I want you, if you, I don't know if you mark your Bibles. If you mark your Bibles, I want you to kind of mark rejoice both times here. Because we're going to see again in a couple of chapters that Paul repeats rejoice again. Okay? This right here is Paul's personal experience. I rejoice. I will rejoice. And then later in chapter 4, he directs us to rejoice. And he repeats himself, and I will say it again, rejoice. Okay? So, so when you see things repeated, pay attention. I mean, you should be paying attention all the time. But when things are repeated, you know there's going to be a test. Okay? So he says, yes, and I will rejoice, verse 19, for I know that through your prayers... And the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, and that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Now, <clears throat> we're coming into a, a, a segment of Philippians um, that a lot of people really don't like. Um, to me, it's one of those. It's one of my my favorite passages. Okay, um, Paul is rejoicing. We see, we know that coming out of his previous um, thought, he says that that Christ is being proclaimed, and because of that, I rejoice. And then he takes rejoice and he transitions into this new thought. I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, we talked about prayer month and a half back and, and what an amazing thing prayer is. If you are a believer and you do not have a healthy prayer life, you don't have a healthy Christian walk. You're stumbling, you're bumbling. You're going to find that your flesh is more often going to have victory over your spirit because prayer is one of the most essential functions that as a believer we can do, we can, do, we can engage in because it connects us to God. I want to talk just a little bit about prayer. Because sometimes we, we have this image of prayer as being something other than what it really is. Um, you know, you don't have to pray King James. God understands our common language. I was going to say common English, but it's not really English, is it? Because <laughs> the English don't understand us. <laughs> We don't have to use big words to impress God. He invented them. Okay? He, he, he's the one that knows how they all work together, much more so than we do. So let's think about prayer for a moment. When Jesus separated himself from the disciples, from the crowds, he would go off, often it says, to a lonely place. Uh, and he would what? Pray. Now, if you have a King James Bible, he prayed in King James. If you have an NASB or an ESB or one of the, the uh, other translations, he, he prayed in English. Uh, just, just normal American ease. Um, actually, he was not praying in either of those. Um, but I love the openness that he has with the Father. 
One of, one of the men in the Bible that amazes me the most, uh, I, I, sometimes I have a little bit of a hard time wrapping my brain around him, is David. Um, David, wow, wow. He was a man's man, all right? Uh, scripture says the first time that we're introduced to him is when Samuel comes and he's looking for the next king of Israel. And, and he's actually mentioned as, as a shepherd, as the youngest, and, and having been a shepherd as a child. They, they, they're looking at him as, as young. And then we see him a little bit later. He's taking some supplies to the army uh, on behalf of his father. And, and he goes to see his brothers. And, and then this ginormous Philistine comes out and, and challenges the, the, the entirety of the, the Hebrew army. And there's not one that will go out and meet him. Now think about this for a moment. Saul was head and shoulders above every other man in Israel. He's a big dude. Or they're really short. <laughs> it, scripture doesn't say, but the implication is that he's, he's a large man. Okay, He's not going out there. He's not going out there. Uh, we know that uh, David had some men around him that were, were mighty men of God, and, and we have no reason to suspect that it was only because of David and that generation that they were mighty men. We see some of the things that men did in the book of Judges and, and through the book of Samuel, and we understand that, that God could use anybody, and I think that was the problem with Israel, is, is they were looking at their own ability to meet the giant, and they didn't have an innate ability that would allow them to do this. But here comes David. I'll take him on. How desperate must have Saul been that they would have brought him to Saul and say, hey, he's a volunteer. <laughs> Seriously. Think about this. Goliath had been coming out every day for 30 days to challenge him, to mock them. And here comes David. I'll do it. He couldn't wear the armor. He couldn't fight in the armor. He had no skill with the sword. So he goes out, just as he did to shepherd the sheep. But his faith is not in his ability. His faith is in the God of Israel. Amen. Okay. What amazes me about David is David is as bluntly real as you can be. You read the Psalms. And when he didn't like what was going on, he brought it to God. And being a warrior, he would often say, hey God, get my enemies. Make it bad for them. Wipe them off the face of the earth. Purge them. And I, 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 I wonder at this, this man who was loved of God. Because a lot of times in the world today, we don't think as, as Christians, that's, that's not our thinking. Because David was referring to physical enemies. Well, we don't have physical enemies, remember? What does Paul say in Ephesians? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. All the flesh and blood that comes up against us, they're just tools of the enemy. Or this world system. Okay, Our struggle is with the enemy of mankind, with the enemy of God, the devil. And I, I, let me just share this with you. Look, if you don't believe the devil is real, he has done a magnificent job of deceiving you. Okay? Because you cannot read scripture and not come to the conclusion by the way he has talked about that anybody in scripture, even Jesus, saw him as anything but real. He was and is a person, a fallen angel, far, far, far greater than we are, but not greater than God. And there is a day coming, and you look around the world today, and it looks like that day's coming pretty darn quick, where he will get his comeuppance. He will be put in his place, okay? so. Coming back around here, prayer. 
um, David amazes me because he is a man of prayer. You read the Psalms, and those are prayers. Those are him communicating with God. That's, that's him just opening up and being real with God. Now, I absolutely believe that you need to be real with God, but I also think you need to watch yourself. You need to be careful because you've got to remember that he is God. And, and our petulance does no good. Our temper tantrums do no good. Do not ever accuse God. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you honestly, um, this week stunk. This week was lousy for me. It, w it was just one of those days, one of those weeks where it seemed like every time I turned around, I got kicked in the teeth. But I know that God is good. Sometimes I don't see it in the moment. Sometimes it sure doesn't feel like it. But what truth am I going to hold to? I've got to. Because without scripture, I'm lost. Without his promises, I'm lost. So, last night, when the basement flooded, again, my first reaction was, filth and foul. Because the stuff flooding out was filth and foul. Uh, yeah. Yeah. When I went to bed, I just I just had one of those heavy sighs. And it's like, God, can we be done with this? Can can we please just be done? Just just for a while. And uh it was quiet. He didn't answer me. Not, not where I could hear. He didn't give me any particular passage of scripture to read. Um, he, he was quiet. And I think sometimes, no, I think all the time, uh, in our greatest tests, God is quiet. Because he wants to see if we are going to hold fast to the truth that we have. Okay. Um, I watch the kids there's, uh, Fridays and Saturdays, and one of the things that I have noticed about watching the kids, uh, every, every day that I watch them, we have rest time. They don't have to sleep, but they do have to be quiet for a period of time. And one of the things that I've noticed is if they're not quiet, they don't rest. If they talk or if they play, they don't rest. And if they talk and they play, the ones that should be sleeping don't sleep. And when the ones that should be sleeping don't sleep, the rest of the day doesn't go nearly as well. <laughs> there needs to be quiet. And I think sometimes that's what God does. In the midst of the test, he wants us to hold fast to what we know. That's what faith is. Even when it doesn't look like it. Even when it doesn't look like it, that's what faith is, holding to the truth that he's given us. Okay, So prayer, getting alone. Uh, Jesus actually told us to have a prayer closet. Um, I, I would heartily encourage you to have a place that you go to pray where you will not be disturbed. Don't bring your phone. Um, don't make it your bed unless you're going to kneel at the side of it. Uh, it's too easy when you're in bed to start praying and then fall asleep. And that makes your prayer time really ineffective. Um, but, but have a place. Uh, in the summer, my place is out either on my swing or on the, the stairs of my deck. In the winter, it's in my red chair. Sometimes it's just in my room where nobody can hear me. Sometimes they hear me because sometimes I get loud when I'm laying out my complaint before God. Um, <laughs> Don't tell me you haven't complained to God. I won't believe you. Uh, so prayer. Foundational, fundamental. 
if you want to grow in Christ, if you want to mature as a believer, if you want victory in your life, you have got to have a healthy prayer life. Okay? When Jesus went to heaven, when he was ascended, and, and the disciples all saw him go, they went back to the town and, 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 and to Jerusalem. What did they do? They prayed. Now, uh, just, just a little side note, um, I also believe that you need corporate prayer. You need to have prayer, private prayer between you and God. You also, I believe absolutely, you have to have corporate prayer. You have to be together with other believers to pray. Okay? There's a different dynamic at work. I don't understand why. I don't understand how exactly it works, but it is a, a different dynamic. Okay? Uh, and by the way, I'm praying that God starts bringing you guys out Wednesday night, so get ready. All right? <laughs> Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, here. Um, all right, so now let's get back here. I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, if we stop right there, we can look historically and understand what that deliverance was, can't we? Because historically, we know that, that Paul was set free from this imprisonment. We know he was delivered. And, and he went on and had several more years of ministry before he was back in prison again. But if we stop right there, we could see, hey, hey man, they prayed, the Spirit of God moved, it. there's this dynamic, this dysfunction that happens when, when you pray according to the Spirit of God and the Spirit moves, we, it, it knits together, it makes something marvelous. But, but look at what he says his deliverance could be. Okay? Because Paul's deliverance isn't necessarily just being set free, is it? Because going down here in verse 20, he says, uh, uh, will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul was looking at deliverance in two very distinct ways, wasn't he? The first one was a physical deliverance from house arrest. And that's actually what transpired. Paul was set free to carry on the ministry. And, and, and you need to kind of get an understanding of what really happened in Paul's life to understand what's going on in, in this, this passage here. Okay? Um, these aren't just words that were put down to teach us something. Paul was a real person. He was really going through these things, and God was really using him in these ways, okay? And when you start to understand all of these things, all, all these things connected, you know, it, it's precept upon precept, and we have a firm foundation. So Paul, he says, hey, it's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. But with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. What is his goal here? To honor Christ. To honor Christ. To honor Christ. That's the end result of everything that Paul is looking for, is that Christ yeah. would be honored. Yes. <laughs> I've, I've got a, a competitor here. Yeah. <laughs> hey. <clears throat> what are you doing? You don't know? <laughs> come here. No? You going to come up and preach? Well, then go sit down and be quiet. <laughs> For the visitors, that's my grandson. <laughs> I would still do it to their kids, but they're not here right now. <laughs> the end result of what every Christian should aspire to in this life is to glorify, to honor Christ and to honor God. Okay? That should be what our primary focus is. Now that can be done in a lot of different ways. Okay? The way that they were honoring Christ this morning with the praise and the worship up here, that, that was honoring, but that was their way to honor Christ. Okay? I don't go up there. I go here. This is the way that I honor Christ. The way that you honor Christ is, is going to be uh, unique to you. But I will tell you this. 
It's got to, in some way, be wrapped up in testimony and witness. Okay, because if it's not wrapped up in testimony and witness, um, who, who, who is really hearing you honor Christ? Right? Right? Okay. Um, all right, next week we're going to dig deeper into this passage. We're going to get all the way down through verse 26. Um, I want you guys to read that. Jot down some notes so you understand kind of what, what's going on in Paul's thinking here. Um, as I said, I love this passage. Uh, I think Paul um, was really on to something here. So, um, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth, for your life. I ask God that you would open our minds to understand. Holy Spirit, teach us what we need to know. Make clear to us those things that are rubbish, those things that are of no value, that we might set them aside, that we might pick up those things that are pure and holy and of great value. Birth in us a desire to be intimate with you, to dwell constantly in your presence, regardless of where we are or what we're doing, that we would be in communion with you. Teach us your word. Teach us your will. Teach us to pray. Teach us to worship. Teach us to be still. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.